Welcome to the show that focuses on Africa, leadership and development. This week we host Sandy Okoro, Senior Vice President and World Bank Group General Counsel. We get your views on the issues. And as always, we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishu. On the show this week, we are happy to host an incredible woman, Sandy Okoro. Her profile speaks for itself. Let's take a look at her achievements. Sandy Okoro is a Senior Vice President and World Bank Group General Counsel for the World Bank Group. Prior to joining the World Bank Group, she has been a General Counsel of HSBC Global Asset Management and Deputy General Counsel of HSBC Retail Banking and Wealth Management since 2014, prior to which she was Global General Counsel at Barings. In July 2014, Sandy was awarded an honorary doctorate in law by City University London in recognition of her career in business and law and her voluntary work. Sandy is named in the Powerlist 2015 as the fourth most influential black person in Britain. Sandy received the 2014 Chambers Europe Award for Excellence in the category for Outstanding Contribution to the Legal Profession. In May 2016, Sandy was named by CTAM as one of the Power 100 Women and in June 2016, she was named in position number 30 as one of the Financial Times Upstanding 100 Leading Ethnic Minority Executives. Most recently, in July 2016, Sandy was named as one of the 100 women to watch by the female FTSE board 2016 and in November 2016, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the UK's Black Solicitors Network. Thank you so much, Sandy, for making time to be with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Just taking a look at your career, uh, the scope of things that you've done, um, it's quite remarkable. So let me start with a very personal question. How did you get to be where you are today? What do you think are the characteristics that really did help you and what advice do you have for other women out there? Well, first of all, thank you, Julie, for inviting me on your show. It's absolutely fantastic to be here and fantastic to be here in Kenya. So it's absolutely wonderful. Um, what would I, how did I get here? That's a very interesting question. And I think I got here by being quite determined and being quite ambitious. And I don't think ambition is a wrong word. It's a good word for women to have. We often think there's going to be something wrong having um, ambition. So from a very early age, I wanted to be a lawyer. From about the age, in, in, in primary school, I wanted to be a lawyer. And I grew up in the UK. My father was from Nigeria. My mother was from Trinidad. So I'm dual heritage and a third heritage British. Um, and I used to watch programs on television about being a lawyer. And I decided I wanted to be a judge. I thought that was me. I felt it was my calling. And People would try and put me off doing that. They would say things like, you know, little black girls from Balham don't become judges, that sort of thing. But I thought, you know what, it's going to be a different story for me. Just because people haven't done it before doesn't mean I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So I was quite determined. And there were many things that came my way, but what encouraged me, my mother was very encouraging, my father was very encouraging. They really valued education. And so I stuck. I stuck to my guns and I did qualify. Um, the other thing later on people would say to me is that, you know, do you really want to go in the city and become a financial services lawyer? Again, women don't do that. Again, black women don't do that. And I said, well, they do now. So, <laughs> so I pursued it. And so I think the one characteristic, resilience. I love that resilience, determination, focus, and you can be the first. If people don't do it, you can be the first anyway. Um, you also have a bold style about you, you know? You can't be put in a box. Now for women in, 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 in the, their careers in most formal environments, that's extremely difficult. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you carry yourself through and your personality through in, in very formal environments? Well, I think because of the background that I came from in the UK, I was often only the only black female in the room and sometimes the only female in the room. So you might as well stand out. People are going to notice you anyway, so why try and hide in a corner? Um, so I thought, you know, be myself, be my true self. I like fashion, I like clothes, I like heels, I like my accessories. Why hide that? I like to have short hair. Why be different? I think it's really important to take your authentic self 
to work. Because by the time you go up through your career, people hire you less for what you can do, but who you are. And if you've hidden that self, you'll be hired into the wrong job eventually. So that's the, that's the difference. And leadership, I think, is doing something different to everybody else. If you do the same as everybody else, you're not really leading. So I feel to be my genuine self, I'm more successful, I'm more relaxed. And it may be a very bold style, but it, it served me well. It works, it, it works. works. So, you know, <laughs> take that with you. That, be ambitious and be your authentic self. It is good enough, you are good enough. Um, I want to come to Africa for a moment before I come back to some serious gender issues mm. that I want us to examine. Just looking at the continent right now, and look, you know, the world is, is, is in a crazy space right now. So much change is happening, mm. some is very worrying there are huge opportunities as well when you look at Africa's positioning in this global environment what do you see as the greatest challenges and the greatest opportunities for the continent well let me start with opportunities because that's a very positive thing I have been so impressed during my visit here uh, to Kenya it's it's vibrant it's got that spirit of something's just about to happen um, the energy you just can't miss it and also very very importantly the actual you know pure intelligence you can feel from the population it's a very very bright energetic well-educated population and I think that energy of wanting to do something it is something I don't feel when I'm when I'm in Europe in mm -hmm. the same way and that, that that's very inspiring um, and I think you feel inspired by Kenya and you feel inspired by um, the continent of Africa as a whole actually because mm -hmm. you feel that coming through uh, in many places and I think now is Africa's time uh, it's long been coming, but I think it's time now because it has that hope and that optimism that you feel that some places in the world do not have. And yes, there's a lot of challenge out mm. there. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of fragility. Let's not forget that. That's very important and very real. But I've always been an optimist. And I always think the world, if you look back in history, people have never predicted anything quite right. Yes. So if you're thinking it's going to not be so good, I predict it will be good. Who knows what's around the corner to change things? I, I, mean, do, I yes. do feel morale in the world at the moment it's is low. in a bit of a dip. Right. Um, and I think it's incumbent on everybody to bring it out of that. If we all bring ourselves up and are hopeful and are optimistic, it will, optimism and pessimism cost the same. They're both free. So why not <laughs> hold <laughs> up an optimist? Be an optimist, yes, exactly. for goodness sake. Um, so let's stay with, um, you know, the violence that you've mentioned. And, and in particular, I, you know, I want to come to gender issues. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of things. The fact that, for instance, um, in, in you know, countries that are experiencing conflict, women are, are really used yes. as, rape is used as a, as a weapon of war. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, the women are enslaved and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, horrifying what's happening to girls and women in these mm -hmm. spaces. Um, but even in some of the countries where we've established some level of stability, we're still fighting things mm -hmm. like early marriage. Yes. We're still fighting FGM. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting gender-based violence, mm -hmm. uh, wife battering in homes, mm -hmm. where in societies where it's accepted as a norm. Um, there's a lot of mind set change we still have to go through what are your thoughts on how we can win and actually bring ourselves out of this difficult situation I think it is a situation that we do need to bring ourselves out of because women need to pay an important part in society and with gender-based violence with early marriage with child defilement mm -hmm. that's not going to happen if women don't feel safe they can't contribute and if women can't contribute then countries won't development develop Gender-based violence is actually a development issue. It's not just a women's issue. It's an issue about society. Mm -hmm. Women, if they don't feel free, they can't, they can't get an education. They can't provide for their families, et cetera, et cetera. So that is so important. What do we do about it? Well, I think everybody has to decide to change it, mm -hmm. men and women. And people have to stand up against it and say, it's not acceptable. And there's so many things that can be done. But when you look at it, and it's not just actually a problem that is based in particular continents, it's a problem that is worldwide, mm -hmm. and it's not being addressed. And that's the problem. It's being hidden under the carpet a little bit. People aren't addressing it or saying it's too hard. And it really needs to be addressed and grappled as an issue that isn't sort of tucked away under a subset of some other issue. It's an issue on its own. And that really needs to be dealt with. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues.
Sandy, let me ask this because we're in the we're past we're 2017. That's where we are now, yeah. and and it's hard to imagine, you know, when we were younger, that we'd still be grappling with this gender exactly. issue exactly. Um, at this point in time. Why do you feel that? Some are just unwilling to give an equal space to women. What it just seems sensible, but why is it so difficult? Do you think? Because people have to give up something. But do they? Well, I think they feel they do. Okay. okay. And you feel you're letting someone else in. You don't have to give up something. But that's what people feel you're going to do. There's plenty of room and plenty of prosperity mm -hmm. for everybody if everybody contributes towards that. So I, th I still think there is this residuary feeling that a woman's place is a certain place. I think that is dying out, but I think until we conquer that, you're really not going to get the buy-in that women can play an equal part. And that's, that's, that's all it is, is one, it, why, if a woman wants to contribute towards her, her village, her family, her society, her profession, why shouldn't she do that? Mm -hmm. You know, why shouldn't women be in the armed forces, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera? Because in, you know, in some time, it's, it's been difficult for women to break some glass ceilings, mm -hmm. but why? And I think it's simply because people won't let them because they feel they have something to lose. Actually, they have everything to gain. Mm -hmm. And if you look at societies where they have let women do more, those are societies that have gained. They still haven't got it completely right, by no means, but they have pushed forward. And I think now's the time to really say, look, let's stop. This is not going to happen just because it's gonna happen. We need to make it happen. Mm -hmm. It's too slow, and it's too slow everywhere. Yes, um, looking at the economics of it, in some of our communities, you know, you'll find that women in the informal sector are really holding the communities up, yes. but they're really locked into micro and, and small businesses. Mm -hmm. they, they don't get the opportunities to scale up. There's a lot of training required. Um, and so a lot of potential can be unleashed there. Mm -hmm. Do you see partners willingly come together to, to change the situation and make sure they do empower these kinds of women? Well, I think there's a lot that can be done um, so that when when um, from, from the very beginning, um, when women are entering the workplace, so coming from school or coming from university or whatever, I think on the part of women for themselves, they've got to shoot for the top mm -hmm. and, and push for that. Mm -hmm. I think also um, in any um, part of a company, any part of a business, whatever it is, they've got to take control of that as well and people have let, got to let them take control mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem that I have seen um, is when it comes to economic empowerment is women are pushed down a little bit, they're not given the opportunity, they're not given the financing, they're not believed that they can bring this business forward. Their ideas are shut down a little bit. There are so many layers to that and it is so complex. Women's voices need to be heard. I think there's some quite simple things here yes. that if you let their voices heard at all levels, things will improve for everybody. We do have ideas, we do have ways of doing things, but sometimes we're shut down. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all experienced that a, 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 as women. Finding our voice is actually quite a difficult thing. And for those who have succeeded, they've really pushed. And then you get a reputation for being pushy and difficult to deal with. Um, so it, it's really tricky, but th the economic empowerment of women is very important. And in a way, it goes back to safety for women mm -hmm. as well. Because if the world is not a safe place or women don't feel it's a safe place for them, how are you going to get that economic empowerment? You have to go out of your communities to do that. Your communities have to be safe in order for you to do that. And also, you need to see women in all ranks and in, at every level. So you need to see them in the police force, uh, in the lawmaking side, in the judiciary, in the army, in industry, everywhere you need to see them everywhere because otherwise it's, it's just not going to happen it adds value it adds a perspective absolutely um, and just for everybody watching to know that that you know if you feel you're not being heard just make your voice louder it doesn't matter if they absolutely. say you're absolutely. Just, keep, absolutely. just keep She's going <laughs> yes. I'll come back to what you said at the beginning and you spoke about uh, being ambitious yes you know a lot of women will go into uh, an, an office for a job interview and find it very hard to market themselves you know a million good things you You've done but you feel like you don't want to brag or you'll be sitting down negotiating your contract and you just feel you can't push too hard whereas a man will go for double yes. and he'll brag his way into the position mm -hmm. um, 
what must we learn as women in terms of uh, balancing being arrogant and pushy, as people might describe it, and, and ensuring that we are standing our ground and we are getting what we deserve in terms of value? I, how do we balance that? It's a difficult thing because as women, I feel, often feel we're programmed to be self-depreciating. And you often see 10 things somebody might need in a job and a woman would look at and say, oh, I can only do seven, therefore I'm not going for it. And a, a man maybe look at four or five and say, yep, I can definitely do that job. So we tend to be self-depreciating. What we need is to have confidence in ourselves. So if we don't have confidence in ourselves, no one else is going to have confidence in us. So when we walk into that room for that job interview or for that salary negotiation, we have to believe we're worth it. Right. So first of all, we have to deal with something internal. In, yes, we have to deal with that gremlin on our shoulder mm -hmm. that tells us we're not. And we have to listen. So we get rid of the bad gremlin and we listen to the good gremlin that says, you know, today you're going to rock. Today it's going to be fabulous and you are fabulous and you deserve this. And don't worry about whether someone thinks you're pushy or you're being ambitious because that's probably a false perception right. most of the time. And having been in a position where I've managed a number of people, it's really interesting to see the way men deal with certain things and the way women deal with certain things. And they often underplay themselves. Yeah. But you can't push them to that. You can, you can mentor them and you can help them along. But I would say grab it. You can, you can do it. Be confident in yourself. If you think you're worth it, say it. And if you think you're worth it, you will not take violence in the home. Exactly. If you think you're worth it, you will be able to identify yes. opportunities, be more bold and ambitious exactly. in the things that you do. Um, so important, you spoke of your parents at the beginning. Um, as parents, sometimes it feels you're almost maneuvering <laughs> through, through the job, you know? The, it's, it's just such a difficult world. Um, but we've got to focus on doing the right things for our children. Mm -hmm. So um, what was it in particular that your mom and dad did with you that enabled you to be so bold, do you think? I think it was one thing which they said to me, if you want it, go for it. There mm -hmm. should be nothing that stands in your way except yourself. So they really brought me up to think there were no excuses. So if it didn't happen, it was down to me. It wasn't going to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that gave me such strength to push away some of these things that get in your way that a lot of noise and end in isms like sexism and racism, etc. And I kind of proved a lot of people wrong about certain things where they said I could work and I couldn't work. Those were actually more myths that people tended to have and stereotypes about certain jobs and certain roles mm -hmm. than the reality of it. And my parents never held me back from anything. And in particular, my dad didn't. Right. Coming he, empo from, he empowered He empowered you. me. He empowered me. And he always said, well, if you want to do it, do it. His, his thing was, just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I love my dad. He was always, oh, be careful, be careful, be, ca but wow. be careful. Wow. And, was very, and he was very proud. Yeah. He never tried to instill in me that there were particular things that a woman should do. Yeah. And actually, that's very important because it was a very traditional household. My dad was head of the household. If he was not up for for me going down a professional route, it may not have happened quite yeah, so you, easily. You might have been less inclined exactly, to try. Exactly, okay. exactly. So very interesting. You know, for the men, we need your support. And um, look up He For She online and see how you can be part of empowering the women in your lives. We want to grow this continent together. Um, you do a lot of community work. I do. Um, and you had an opportunity to visit a girls' school while you were I here did. in Kenya. So tell me about that experience and you know, what struck you the most. Oh, I will never forget that. Um, it was absolutely amazing. Um, it was Majakos Girls School, high yeah. school for girls. Um, it was my, this is my first mission uh, in my new role at the World Bank. And um, I really wanted to visit a high school and, and see some girls and, and, and try and say a few words uh, for them. Because at that age, you know, you're quite ambitious about what you want to do. And I wanted to let them know you can do it and yeah. see someone that was like them, that had, had been them once. And it was amazing. And um, for my first mission, that was something that I will never forget. Those smiling faces, full of hope, full of ambition, so clever and so intelligent. Mm -hmm. We had some amazing questions from the audience, really tricky ones from the girls. Um, and it was just great to see them. And I think, I, I mean, if that is the future mm -hmm. of Kenyan women, 
Kenya has a great future. Wow. And that was just one girls' school. Wow. Um, they were very, very impressive. And the choir sang for us as well. And they were absolutely amazing. And there are lots of superlatives there, but they're worth it. And I hope that they all realize that anything they want to do right now, that that seed of ambition, water it with confidence because it will grow into fruition. Wow, so well done Machakos girls, you've been inspirational, yeah. but I, I can tell you, right across the country, that is the mood. The girls are amazing, the boys are amazing as well, and that is the greatest hope perhaps yes. for this continent. If yes. we get it right with them, mm -hmm. then things will work out somehow. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming to the close, but I, I just want to focus on your role at the bank yes. and what you're hoping to achieve. And in terms of Africa, what, what gains maybe can we, can we look at or hope for um, under the World Bank? Well, I think there are a couple of things there that I would like to see during my time mm -hmm. there as um, the, the general counsel. I would very much like to do some work around capacity building. Um, and to ensure that um, you know we Im we share the wisdom that we have in the bank mm -hmm. as well. So particularly from the legal side, so capacity building is a very important thing to me. And just going back to what we said before, the gender-based violence, the defilement, the early marriage. Want to look at that FGM? Really want to bring that to the fore. For me, from a legal perspective as well, um, and it, but it's not just about the law, it's about cultural changes too. But to really, together with my colleagues, because it's not something that I would do on my own, in fact I would probably play quite a small part, but to put that on the agenda as a black female general counsel at the World Bank, I have to do that. Wow, you are inspiring. Thank it's you. been such a pleasure. Um, I want to finish by asking you to give a direct message to all our viewers watching. And you know, um, when you look at the context that we're in, you said to us you're optimistic and you see hope and potential for Africa and you see Africa rising. There are a lot of Africans who don't see that and who feel a little bit lost, a little bit hopeless. There is a lot of self self-loathing um, mm -hmm. in Africa. We've been fed by such negative images of ourselves and of our cultures and, and, and you know, mm -hmm. what would you say to all those people watching? What should they know about themselves and about this continent and, and, and a role, what role can they play in helping Africa rise, please? Um, I would say to all of you out there who feel disenfranchised, don't. Draw a line under it today and say that you can do anything you want to do if you believe in yourself. Don't put self-imposed barriers in front of yourself. Go for it. Go for it for yourself, your family, your country. You will uncover so many talents you didn't know you had. Difficulty is good. It gives you talents. It brings out the best in you. And trust yourself that you come from one of the greatest the greatest continent in the world in my view that has such fantastic potential and you are part of it you're not a sideshow oh that's amazing thank you so much thank you thank what you a very pleasure. much thank, thank you, very you. Much. stay with the africa leadership dialogues We go straight to your views on the issues now after that inspiring interview. This week we asked you, in your view, how can the one-third gender representation play a crucial role in pushing women to take up leadership roles? Charles Mudaura says, by emphasizing to women the strengths they have in one common voice can go a long way in helping women push agendas that could be affecting them. My name is Jasmine Gathu. I'm watching Africa Leadership Dialogue from Nairobi, Kenya. This rule gives women legislators a chance of joining their male compatriots in formulating agenda inclusive rules. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254 715 816 And now, to Africa's top. 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature the most promising young women entrepreneurs. There's a rising tide of entrepreneurship sweeping across Africa, and the young women are riding it vigorously. A growing number of young African women are setting out to write their own destinies, establishing remarkable enterprises that will transform Africa and reignite its economies. This is according to Forbes. Starting us off at number 10 is Rachel Sibande. Originally from Malawi, Sibande founded MHub in 2013. 
M-Hub is an incubator for technology startups with a special focus on building young technology entrepreneurs through training, skill development, and mentorship. Coming in at number 9 is Hilda Mora. Mora, a Kenyan by birth, is the founder of Weza Tele, a startup that provides a number of value-added mobility solutions in commerce, supply chains, distribution, and mobile payment integration. Positioned in at number 8 is Vanessa Zomi, founder of the Emerald Moringa Tea. Zomi from Cameroon partnered with Moringa farmers who supplied her with the leaves which she processed into Moringa tea. Moringa tea reduces blood sugar levels thereby treating diabetes. Taking the number 7 spot is Olatorera Oniru. Oniru is the founder of Dress Me Outlet, a Nigerian e-tailer of fashion products, health and beauty products and home goods. Slotted in at number 6 is Nicole Onome Yembra. Nicole is a partner of the Greenhouse Capital which was launched officially in Nigeria in 2016. Greenhouse Capital takes on fintech-enabled portfolio companies looking to transform the education, renewable energy, big data, and fintech ecosystems. At number 5 is Sonia Mugabo. Sonia is the founder of the Sonia Mugabo, otherwise known as SM, her eponymous fashion brand. She is a self-taught designer who has focused her brand on sourcing locally included materials, employees, and models from her home country of Rwanda. Jennifer Shigoli comes in at number 4. Jennifer, a trained lawyer and diplomat, is the founder of Malkia Investments Company Limited, a company that produces and distributes personal hygiene products. Anchored in at number 3 is Lucia Bukulumpagi Wamala. Lucia is the founder and CEO of Bakulu Power, a Ugandan renewable energy company currently developing three solar mini-grids on islands off Lake Victoria and a clean cooking fuel production plant on a refugee camp in western Uganda. Coming in at number 2 is Teta Isibo. Rwandan-born Teta Isibo is the founder of Inzuki Designs, a young Rwandan brand specializing in jewelry, accessories and interior decor handmade primarily from local materials. At number one this week is Gloria Michelle Otieno Muka. Gloria founded Recalls for Kenya Consultants Limited, R4 Kenya, a fast-growing professional HR services firm in 2013. Recalls for Kenya offers professional HR services in consultancy, recruitment, training, psychometric testing, and staff outsourcing. And that's Africa's Top 10 this week. As always, we end the show with words of wisdom. And this week, we share the words of the late Professor Wangare Mathai. She said, African women in general need to know that it's okay for them to be the way they are, to see the way they are as a strength, and to be liberated from fear and from silence. So African women, it's time to rise. Blessings to you. Blessings to Africa.